Greetings, Middle Earthers. Welcome to the the uh, well. The Silmarillion is finished, but there is still some reading to do. Some rather large tales. Um, I was thinking of skipping a Calabeth. This is long, but we're going to do it. And then we're going to have, uh, finally, at the Rings of Power in the Third Age, which uh, I think will be, um, which will be very uh, familiar to a lot of you because it leads right into the, um, the, uh, the Lord of the Rings. But I feel that uh, in order to get there, we have to do it all. I think if I skip to Calabeth, then read the Rings of Power and posted it, I'd be all, wouldn't be able to sleep until I actually finished the whole thing. So here we go. We start with a nice picture. And, uh, <clears throat> and we settle in. Let me just take a sip of water before I begin. Right. Acalabeth. The Downfall of Numenor. It is said by the Eldar that men came into the world in the time of the shadow of Morgoth, and they fell swiftly under his dominion. For he sent his emissaries among them, and they listened to his evil and cunning words, and they worshipped the darkness and yet feared it. But there were some that turned from evil and left the lands of their kindred and wandered ever westward. For they had heard a rumour that in the west there was a light which the shadow could not dim. The servants of Morgoth pursued them with hatred, and their ways were long and hard. Yet they came at last to the lands that look upon the sea, and they entered Beleriand in the days of the War of the Jewels. The Adain these were named in their Sindarin tongue, and they became friends and allies of the Eldar, and did deeds of great valour in the war against Morgoth. Of them was sprung upon the side of his father's bright Irindil, and in the lay of Irindil it is told how at the last, when the victory of Morgoth was almost complete, he built his ship Vingolo, that men call Rothenzil, and voyaged upon the unsailed seas, seeking ever for Valinor. For he desired to speak before the powers on behalf of the two kindreds, that the Valar might have pity on them and send them help in their uttermost need. Therefore, by elves and men, he is called Irindil the Blessed, for he achieved his quest after long labours and many perils. And from Valinar there came the host of the lords of the west, but Irindil came never back to the lands that he had loved. In the great battle, when at last Morgoth was overthrown and Thangorodrim was broken, the Adain alone of the kindreds of men fought for the Valar, whereas many others fought for Morgoth. And after the victory of the lords of the west, those of the evil men who were not destroyed fled back into the east, where many of their race were still wandering in the unharvested lands, wild and lawless, refusing alike uh, the summons of the Valagor of the uh, excuse me, refusing alike the summons of the Valar and of Morgoth, and the evil men came among them and cast over them a shadow of fear, and they took them for kings. Then the Valar forsook for a time the men of Middle-earth, who had refused their summons and had taken the friends of Morgoth to be their masters. And men dwelt in darkness and were troubled by many evil things that Morgoth had devised in the days of his dominion, demons and dragons and mishapen beasts, and the unclean orcs that are mockeries of the children of Iluvatar, and the lot of men was unhappy. But Manwe put forth Morgoth and shut him beyond the world in the void that is without, and he cannot himself return again into the world present and visible while the lords of the west are still enthroned. Yet the seeds that he had planted still grew and sprouted, bearing evil fruit, if any would tend them. For his will remained and guided his servants, moving them ever to thwart the will of the Valar and to destroy those that obeyed them. This the lords of the west knew full well, when, therefore, Morgoth had been thrust forth, they held counsel concerning the ages that should come after. The Eldar they summoned to return into the west and that land. And those that hearkened to the summons dwelt in the Isle of Eresea. And there is in that land a haven that is called Avalone, 
I think that's supposed to be a play on Avalon. For it is of all cities the nearest to Valinor, and the Tower of Avalonie is the first sight that the mariner beholds when at last he draws nigh to the undying lands over the leagues of the sea. Yes, to the fathers of men of the three faithful houses, rich reward also was given. Aonve came among them and taught them, and they were given wisdom and power and life more enduring than others of the mortal race have possessed. A land was made for the Adain to dwell in, neither part of Middle-earth nor of Valinor, for it was sundered from either by a wide sea, yet it was nearer to Valinor. It was raised by Ose out of the depths of the great water, and it was established by Ole and enriched by Yavanna, and the Eldor brought thither flowers and fountains out of Tol, at Asea. That land the Valar called Andor, the land of gift, and the star of Erendil shone bright in the west as a token that all was made ready, and as a guide over the sea, and men marvel to see that silver flame in the paths of the sun. Then the Adanes set sail upon the deep waters following the star, and the Valar laid a peace upon the sea for many days and sent sunlight and a sailing wind, so that the waters glittered before the eyes of the Adain like rippling glass, and the foam flew like snow before the stems of their ships. But so bright was Rothenzil that even at morning men could see it glimmering in the west, and in the countless night it shone alone, for no other star could stand beside it. And for setting their course towards it, the Adain came at last over leagues of sea and saw afar the land that was prepared for them, Andor, the, lin the land of gift, shimmering in a golden haze. Then they went up out of the sea and found a country fair and fruitful, and they were glad. And they called that land Elena, Elena which is Starwards, but also Anadune, which is Vesternessa, Numenore in the high Eldaran tongue. This was the beginning of that people that in the grey elven speech are called the Dunedain, the Numenorians, kings among men. But they did not thus escape from the doom of death that Iluvatar had set upon all mankind, and they were mortal still, though their years were long, and they knew no sickness ere the shadow fell upon them. Therefore they grew wise and glorious, and in all things more like to the firstborn than any other of the kindreds of men, and they were tall, taller than the tallest of the sons of Middle-earth, and the light of their eyes were like the bright stars. But their numbers increased only slowly in the land, for though daughters and sons were born to them, fairer than their fathers, yet their children were few. Of old, the chief city and haven of Numenor was in the midst of its western coasts, and it was called Anduinne, because it faced the sunset. But in the midst of the land was a mountain tall and steep, and it was named the Menotarma, the Pillar of Heaven. And upon it was a high place that was hallowed to Eru Aluvatar, and it was open and unroofed, and no other temple or fane was there in the land of the Numenorians. At the feet of the mountain were built the tombs of the kings, and hard by upon a hill was Armenelos, fairest of cities, and there stood the tower and the citadel that was raised by Elros, son of Erendil, whom the Valar appointed to be the first king of the Dunedain. Now Elros and Elrond, his brother, were descended from the three houses of the Adain, but in part also both from the Eldar and the Maiar, for Idril of Gondolin and Nutian, daughter of Melian, were their foremothers. The Valar indeed may not withdraw the gift of death which comes to men from Iluvatar, but in the manner of the half-elven, Iluvatar gave to them judge the judgment, and they judged that to the sons of Erendil should be given choice of their own destiny. And Elrond chose to remain with the firstborn, and to him the life of the firstborn was granted. But to Elros, who chose to be a king of men, still a great span of years was allotted, many times that of the men of Middle-earth, and all his line, the kings and lords of the royal house, had long life even according to the measure of the Numenorians. But Elros lived five hundred years, and ruled the Numenorians four hundred years and ten. Thus the years passed. And while Middle-earth went backward and light and wisdom faded, the Dunedain dwelt under the protection of the Valar and in the friendship of the Eldar, and they increased in stature both of mind and body. For though this people used still their own speech, 
Their kings and lords knew and spoke also the elven tongue, which they had learned in the days of their alliance. And thus they held converse still with the Eldar, whether of Eresea or of the westlands of Middle-earth. And the lore masters among them learned also the high Eldarin tongue of the blessed realm, in which many story and song was preserved from the beginning of the world. And they made letters and scrolls and books, and wrote in them many things of wisdom and wonder in the high tide of their realm, of which all is now forgot. So it came to pass that, beside their own names, all the lords of the Numenorians had also Eldarin names, and the like with the cities and fair places that they founded in Numenor and on the shores of the hitherlands. For the Dunedain became mighty in crafts, so that if they had had the mind, they could easily have surpassed the evil kings of Middle-earth in the making of war and the forging of weapons, but they were become men of peace. Above all arts, they nourished shipbuilding and sea craft, and they became mariners whose like shall never again be since the world was diminished and voyaging upon the wide seas with the chief feat and adventure of their hardy men in the gallant days of their youth. There's a famous photo, or not photo, picture, painting. Indeed. But the lords of Valinor for, forbade them to sail so far westward that the coasts of Numenor could no longer be seen, and for long the Dunedain were content, though they did not fully understand the purpose of this ban. But the design of Manlay was that the Numenorians should not be tempted to seek for the blessed realm, nor desire to overpass the limits set to their bliss, becoming enamored of the immortality of the Valar and the Eldar and the lands where all things endure. For in those days Valinor still remained in the world visible, and there Iluvatar permitted the Valar to maintain upon earth an abiding place, a memorial of that which might have been if Morgoth had not cast his shadow on the world. This the Numenorians knew full well, and at times, when all the air was clear and the sun was in the east, they would look out and descry far off in the west a city white shining on a distant shore, and a great harbor and a tower. For in those days the Numenorians were far-sighted, yet even so it was only the keenest eyes among them that, they, that could see this vision, from the Menotama, maybe, or from some tall ship that lay off their western coast as far as it was lawful for them to go. For they did not dare to break the ban of the lords of the west. But the wise among them knew that this distant land was not indeed the blessed realm of Valinor, but was Avalonie, the haven of the Eldar upon Enesea, easternmost of the undying lands. And thence, at times, the firstborn still would come sailing to, Val to Numenor in oarless boats as white birds flying from the sunset. And they brought to Numenor many gifts, birds of song and fragrant flowers and herbs of great virtue. And a seedling they brought of Celeborn, the white tree that grew in the midst of Eresea. And that was, its in, that was in its turn a seedling of Galatilion, the tree of Tune the image of Telperion that Yavanna gave to the Eldar in the Blessed Realm. And the tree grew and blossomed in the courts of the king and Armenelos. Nimloth it was named, and flowered in the evening, and the shadows of night it filled with its fragrance. Thus it was, thus it was that because of the ban of the Valar, the voyages of the, of the Dunedain in those days went ever eastward and not westward from the darkness of the north to the heats of the south, and beyond the south to the nether darkness. And they came even into the inner seas and sailed about Middle Earth and glimpsed from their high prows the gates of morning in the east. And the Dunedain came at times to the shores of the great lands, and they took pity on the forsaken world of Middle Earth. And the lords of Numenor set forth again upon the western shores in the dark years of men, and yet none dared yet to withstand them. For most of the men of that age that sat under the shadow were now grown weak and fearful. And coming among them, the Numenorians taught them many things, corn and wine they brought, and they instructed men in the sowing of seed and the grinding of grain, in the hewing of wood and the shaping of stone, and in the ordering of their life such as it might be in the lands of swift death and little bliss. Then the men of Middle-earth were comforted, and here and there upon the western shores the houseless woods drew back, and men shook off the yoke of the offspring of Morgoth, and unlearned their terror of the dark. 
and they revered the memory of the tall sea kings, and when they had departed they called them gods, hoping for their return. For at that time the Numenorians dwelt never long in Middle-earth, nor made there as yet any habitation of their own. Eastward they must sail, but ever west their hearts returned. Now this yearning grew ever greater with the years, and the Numenorians began to hunger for the undying city that they saw from afar, and the desire of everlasting life to escape from death and the ending of delight grew strong upon them, and ever as their power and glory grew greater, their unquiet increased. For though the Valar had rewarded the Dunedain with long life, they could not take from them the weariness of the world that comes at last, and they died, even their kings of the seed of Erendil, and the span of their lives was brief in the eyes of the Eldar. Thus it was that a shadow fell upon them, in which maybe the will of Morgoth was at work that still moved in the world. And the Numenorians began to murmur, at first in their hearts and then in open words, against the doom of men, and most of all against the ban which forbade them to sail into the west. And they said among themselves, why do the lords of the West sit there in peace unending while we must die and go we know not whither, leaving our home and all that we have made? And the Eldar die not, even those that rebelled against the lords. And since we have mastered all seas and no water is so wild or so wide that our ships cannot overcome it, why should we not go to Avalonie and greet there our friends? Sounds like a bit of an Adam and Eve uh, uh, story. And some there were who said, Why should we not go even to Aman and taste there, were it but a, for a day the bliss of the powers? Have we not become mighty among the people of Arda? The Eldar reported these words to the Valar, and Manwe was grieved, seeing a cloud gather on the noontide of Numenor. And he sent messengers to the Dunedain, who spoke earnestly to the king and to all who would listen concerning the fate and fashion of the world. The doom of the world, they said, one alone can change who made it. And were you so to voyage, that escaping all deceits and snares, you came indeed to Aman, the blessed realm, little would it profit you. For it is not the land of Manve that makes its people deathless, but the deathless that dwell therein have hallowed the land. And there you would but wither and grow weary the sooner, as moths in a light too strong and steadfast. But the king said, And does not Irendil, my forefather, live? Or is he not in the land of Aman? To which they answered, You know that he has a fate apart, and was adjudged to the firstborn who die not. Yet this also is his doom, that he can never return again to mortal lands. Whereas you and your people are not of the firstborn, but are mortal men as Aluvatar made you. Yet it seems that you desire now to have the good of both kindreds, to sail to Valinor when you will, and, re and to return when you please to your homes. That cannot be. Nor can the Valar take away the gifts of Aluvatar. The Eldar, you say, are unpunished, and even those who rebelled do not die. Yet that is to them neither reward nor punishment, but the fulfillment of their being. They cannot escape, and are bound to this world never to leave it so long as it lasts, for its life is theirs. And you are punished for the rebellion of men, you say, in which you had small part, and so it is that you die. But that was not at first appointed for punishment. Thus you escape and leave the world and, not, and are not bound to it, in hope or in weariness. Which of us, therefore, should envy the others? And the Numenorians answered, Why should we not envy the Valor, or even the least of the deathless? For of us is required a blind trust and a hope without assurance, knowing not what lies before us in a little while. And yet we also love the earth and would not lose it. Then the messengers said, Indeed, the mind of Iluvatar concerning you is not known to the Valar, and he has not revealed all things that are to come. But this we hold to be true, that your home is not here, neither in the land of Aman nor anywhere within the circles of the world, and the doom of men that they should depart was at first a gift of Iluvatar. 
It became a grief to them only because coming under the shadow of Morgoth, it seemed to them that they were surrounded by a great darkness of which they were afraid. And some grew willful and proud and w would not yield until life was reft from them. We who bear the ever-mounting burden of the years do not clearly understand this. But if that grief has returned to trouble you as you say, then we fear that the shadow arises once more and grows again in your hearts. Therefore, though you be the Dunedain, fairest of men who escaped from the shadow of old and fought valiantly against it, we say to you, Beware. The will of Eru may not be gainsaid, and the Valar bid you earnestly not to withhold the trust to which you are called, lest soon it become again a bond by which you are constrained. Hope rather that in the end even the least of your desires shall have fruit. The love of Arda was set in your hearts by Iluvatar, and he does not plant to no purpose. Nonetheless, many ages of men unborn may pass ere that purpose is made known, and to you it will be revealed, and not to the Valar. These things took place in the days of Ter Sidiatin, the shipbuilder, and of Tara Tamarin, his son, and they were proud men, eager for wealth, and they laid the men of Middle Earth under tribute, taking now rather than giving. It was to Tar Atan Amir that the messengers came, and he was the thirteenth king, and in his day the realm of Numenor had endured for more than two thousand years, and was come to the zenith of its bliss, if not yet of its power. But Atanamir was ill-pleased with the counsel of the messengers, and gave little heed to it, and the greater part of his people followed him, for they wished still to escape death in their own day, not waiting upon hope. And Atanamir lived to a great age, clinging to his life beyond the end of all joy, and he was the first of the Numenorians to do this, refusing to depart until he was witless and unmanned, and denying to his son the kingship at the height of his days. But the lords of Numenor had been wont to wed late in their long lives, and to depart and leave the mastery to their sons when these were come to full stature of body and mind. Then Tar and Kalimon, son of Atanamir, became king, and he was of like mind. And in his day the son of Numenor became divided. On the one hand was the greater party, and they were called the king's men, and they grew proud and were estranged from the Eldar and the Valar. And on the other hand was the lesser party, and they were called the Elendili, the elf friends. For though they remained loyal indeed to the king and the house of Elros, they wished to keep the friendship of the Eldar, and they hearkened to the counsel of the lords of the West. Nonetheless, even they who named themselves the faithful did not wholly escape from the affliction of their people, and they were troubled by the thought of death. Thus the bliss of Westernessa became diminished, but still its might and splendor increased. For the kings and their people had not yet abandoned wisdom, and if they loved the Valar no longer, at least they still feared them. They did not dare openly to break the ban, or to sail beyond the limits that had been appointed. Eastward still they steered their tall ships, but the fear of death grew ever darker upon them, and they delayed it by all means that they could. And they began to build great houses for their dead, while their wise men labored unceasingly to discover if they might the secret of recalling life, or at least of the prolonging of men's days. Yet they achieved only the art of preserving incorrupt the dead flesh of men, and they filled all the land with silent tombs in which the thought of men was enshrined in the darkness. But those that lived turned the more eagerly to pleasure and revelry, desiring ever more goods and more riches. And after the days of Tar and Kalimon, the offering of the first fruits to Eru was neglected, and men went seldom any more to the hallow upon the heights of Meneltarma in the midst of the land. Thus it came to pass in that time that the Numenorians first made great settlements upon the west shores of the ancient lands, for their own land seemed to them shrunken, and they had no rest or content therein, and they desired now wealth and dominion in Middle-earth since the West was denied. Great harbors and strong towers they made, and there many of them took up their abode. But they appeared now rather as lords and masters and gatherers of tribute than as helpers and teachers. 
and the great ships of the Numenorians were borne east on the winds and returned ever laden, and the power and majesty of their kings were increased, and they drank and they feasted and they clad themselves in silver and gold. In all this the elf friends had small part. They alone came now ever to the north and the land of Gilgalad, keeping their friendship with the elves and lending them aid against Sauron. And their haven was Pelargir, above the mouths of Anduin the Great. But the king's men sailed far away to the south, and the lordships and strongholds that they made have left many rumors in the legends of men. In this age, as is elsewhere told, Sauron rose again in Middle-earth and grew and turned back to the evil in which he was nurtured by Morgoth, becoming mighty in his service. Already in the days of Tar Minister, the eleventh king of Numenor, he had fortified the land of Mordor and had built there the tower of Barad-dûr, and thereafter he strove ever for the dominion of Middle-earth to become a king over all kings and as a god unto men. And Sauron hated the Numenorians because of the deeds of their fathers and their ancient alliance of the elves and allegiance to the Valar. Nor did he forget the aid that Tar Minister had rendered to Gilgalad of old, in that time when the One Ring was forged and there was war between Sauron and the elves and Eriador. Now he learned that the kings of Numenor had increased in power and splendor, and he hated them the more, and he feared them, lest they should invade his lands and wrest from him the dominion of the east. But for a long time he did not dare to challenge the lords of the sea, and he withdrew from the coasts. Yet Sauron was ever guileful, and it is said that among those whom he ensnared with the nine rings, three were great lords of Numenorean race. And when the Eleri arose that were the ring raids, his servants, and the strength of his terror and mastery over men had grown exceedingly great, he began to assail the strong places of the Numenorians upon the shores of the sea. In those days the shadow grew deeper upon Numenor, and the lives of the kings of the house of Elros waned because of their rebellion, but they hardened their hearts the more against the Valar. And the twentieth king took the scepter of his fathers, and he ascended the throne in the name of Adunakhor, lord of the west, forsaking the elven tongues and forbidding their use in his hearing. Yet in the scroll of kings the name Herunman, Herunuman was inscribed in the high elven speech because of ancient custom, which the kings feared to break utterly lest evil befall. Now this title seemed to the faithful overproud being the title of the Valar, and their hearts were sorely tried between their loyalty to the house of Elros and their reverence of the appointed powers. But worse was yet to come. For Argilzor, the twenty-third king, was the greatest enemy of the faithful. In his day the white tree was untended and began to decline, and he forbade utterly the use of the elven tongues and punished those that welcomed the ships of Eresea that still came secretly to the west shores of the land. Now the Elendili dwelt mostly in the western regions of Numenor, but, but Argilzor, commanded all that he could discover to be of this party to remove from the west and dwell in the east of the land, and there they would and there they were watched. And the chief dwelling of the faithful in the later days was thus nigh to the harbour of Romina. Thence many set sail to Middle Earth, seeking the northern coasts, where they might speak still with the Eldar in the kingdom of Gilgalad. This was known to the kings, but they hi hindered it not sorry so long as the Elendili departed from their land and did not return. For they desired to end all friendship between their people and the Eldar of Elisea, whom they named the spies of the Valar, hoping to keep their deeds and their counsels hidden from the lords of the West. But all that they did was known to Manwe, and the Valar were wroth with the kings of Numenor, and gave them counsel and protection no more. And the ships of Eresea came never again out of the sunset, and the havens of Anduinae were forlorn. Highest in honor after the house of the kings were the lords of Anduinae, for they were of the line of Elros, being descended from Silmarion, daughter of Tar Elendil, the fourth king of Numenor. And these lords were loyal to the kings and revered them. And the lord of Anduinae, 
was ever among the chief counselors of the scepter. Yet also from the beginning they bore special love to the Eldar and reverence for the Valar. And as the shadow grew, they aided the faithful as they could. But for long they did not declare themselves openly and sought rather to amend the hearts of the lords of the scepter with wiser counsels. There was a lady, Inzobet, renowned for her beauty, and her mother was Lindori, sister of Eriendor, the lord of Anduine, in the lands of Ar Sakaltor, father of Ar Gimilzor. Gimilzor took her to wife, though this was little to her liking, for she was in heart one of the faithful, being taught by her mother. But the kings and their sons were grown proud, and not to be gainsayed by their wishes. No love was there between Ar Gimilzor and his queen, or between their sons. In Zilidun, the elder was like his mother in mind as in body, but Gimil Khad, the younger, went with his father, unless he were yet prouder and more willful. To him, Ar Gimilzor would have yielded the scepter rather than to the eldest son that the laws had allowed. But when in, in Zilidun acceded to the scepter, he took again a title in the elven tongue as of old, calling him Tarl Palantir, for he was far-sighted both in eye and in mind, and even those that hated him feared his words as those of a true seer. He gave peace for a while to the faithful, and he went once more at due seasons to the hollow of Eru upon the metal tama which Ar Gimilzor had forsaken. The white tree he tended again with honor, and he prophesied, saying that when the tree perished, then also would the line of the kings come to its end. But his repentance was too late to appease the anger of the Valar with the insolence of his fathers, of which the greater part of his people did not repent. And Gimilkad was strong and ungentle, and he took the leadership of those that had been called the king's men and opposed the will of his brother as openly as he dared and yet more in secret. Thus the days of Tar Palantir became darkened with grief, and he would spend much of his time in the west, and there ascended often the ancient tower of King Minister upon the hill of Oromet nigh to Anduine, whence he gazed westward in yearning, hoping to see maybe some sail upon the sea. But no sail came ever again from the west to Numenor, and Avalone was veiled in cloud. Now Gimilkad died two years before his two hundredth year, which was accounted an early death for one of Elros's line, even in its waning. But this brought no peace to the king, for Faradzun, son of Gimilkad, had become a man yet more restless and eager for wealth and power than his father. He had fared often abroad as a leader in the wars that the Numenorians made then in the coastlands of Middle-earth, seeking to extend their dominion over men. And thus he had won great renown as a captain both by land and by sea. Therefore, when he came back to Numenor, hearing of his father's death, the hearts of the people were turned for him, for he brought with him great wealth and was for the first time free in his giving. And it came to pass the Tar Palantir grew weary of grief and died. He had no son but a daughter only, whom he named Muriel in the elven tongue. And to her now by right in the laws of Numenorians came the scepter. But Faradzun took her to wife against her will, doing evil in this and evil also in the laws of the Numen evil also in that the laws of Numenor did not permit the marriage, even in the royal house, of those more nearly akin than cousins in the second degree. And when they were wedded, he seized the scepter into his own hand, taking the title of al Farazon, tar Kalian in the elven tongue, and the name of his queen he changed to Ar-Zimrafel. The mightiest and proudest was Ar-Farazon the Golden, of all those that had wielded the scepter of the sea king since the foundation of Numenor, and four and twenty kings and queens had ruled the Numenorians before and slept now in their deep tombs under the mount of Meneltarma, lying upon beds of gold. And sitting upon his carven throne in the city of Armenelus, in the glory of his power, he brooded darkly, thinking of war. For he had learned in Middle-earth of the strength of the realm of Sauron and of his hatred of Westernessa. And now there came to him the masters of ships and captains returning out of the east, and they reported that Sauron was putting forth his might since al Farazun had gone back from Middle-earth and was pressing down upon the cities by the coasts, and he had taken now the title of king of men and declared his purpose to drive the Numenorians into the sea and destroy even Numenor, if that might be. Great was the anger of Ar 
Faradzun at these tidings, and he pondered long in secret. His heart was filled with the desire of power unbounded in the sole dominion of his will. And he determined without counsel of the Valar, or the aid of any wisdom but his own, that the title of king of men he would himself claim, and would compel Sauron to become his vassal and his servant. For in his pride he deemed that no king should ever rise so mighty as to vie with the heir of Erendil. Therefore he began in that time to smithy great hoard of weapons, and many ships of war he built and stored them with his arms. And when all was made ready, he himself set sail with his host into the east. And men saw his sails coming up out of the sunset, dyed as with scarlet and gleaming with red and gold. And fear fell upon the dwellers by the coasts, and they fled far away. But the fleet came at last to that place that was called Umbar, where was the mighty haven of the Numenorians that no hand had wrought. Empty and silent were all the lands about when the king of the sea marched upon Middle-earth. For seven days he journeyed with banner and trumpet, and he came to a hill, and he went up, and he set there his pavilion and his throne, and he sat him down in the midst of the land, and the tents of his host were ranged all about him, blue, golden, and white, as a field of tall flowers. Then he sent forth heralds, and he commanded Sauron to come before him and swear to him fealty. And Sauron came. Even from his mighty tower of Barad-dur he came and made no offer of battle. For he perceived that the power and majesty of the kings of the sea surpassed all rumor of them, so that he could not trust even the greatest of his servants to withstand them. And he saw not his time yet to work his will with the Dunedain. And he was crafty, well skilled to gain what he would by subtlety when force might not avail. Therefore he humbled himself before Ar Faradzun and smoothed his tongue, and men wondered, for all that he had said seemed fair and wise. But Ar Faradzun was not yet deceived, and it came into his mind that for the better keeping of Sauron and of his oaths of fealty, he should be brought to Numenor, there to dwell as a hostage for himself and all his servants in Middle-earth. To this Sauron assented as one constrained, yet in his secret thought he received it gladly, for it chimed indeed with his desire. And Sauron passed over the sea and looked upon the land of Numenor and on the city of Armenelos in the days of its glory, and he was astounded, but his heart within was filled the more with envy and hate. Yet such was his cunning the cunning of his mind and mouth and the strength of his hidden will, that ere three years had passed he had become closest to the secret counsels of the king. For flattery sweet as honey was ever on his tongue, and knowledge he had of many things yet unrevealed to men. And seeing the favor that he had of their lord, all the counselors began to fawn upon him, save one alone, Amandil, lord of Andune. Then slowly a change came over the land, and the hearts of the elf friends were sorely troubled, and many fell away out of fear. And although those that remained still called themselves the faithful, their enemies named them rebels. For now, having the ears of men, Sauron with many arguments gainsaid all that the Valar had taught, and he bade men think that in the world, in the east, and even in the west, there ye lay yet many seas and many lands for their winning, wherein was wealth uncounted. And still, if they should at the last come to the end of those lands and seas, beyond all lay the ancient darkness, and out of it the world was made. For darkness alone is worshipful, and the Lord thereof may yet make other worlds to be gifts to those that serve him, so that the increase of their power shall find no end. And Ar Faradzun said, Who is the Lord of the darkness? Then behind locked doors Sauron spoke to the king, and he lied, saying, it is he whose name is not yet spoken, for the Valar have deceived you concerning him, putting forward the name of Eru, a phantom devised in the folly of their hearts, seeking to enchain men in servitude to themselves. For they are the oracle of this Eru, which speaks only when they, what they will. But he that is their master shall yet prevail, and he will deliver you from this phantom, and his name is Melkor, Lord of all, giver of freedom, and he shall make you stronger than they. Then al Faradzun the king turned back to the worship of the dark, and of Melkor the lord thereof, at first in secret, but ere long openly and in the face of his people, and they for the most part followed him. 
Yet there dwelt still a remnant of the faithful, as has been told, at Romena and in the city and in the country near, and other few there were here and there in the land. The chief among them to whom they looked for leading and courage in evil days was Amandil, counsellor of the king, and his son Elendil, whose sons were Isildur and Anarion, then young men by the reckoning of Numenor. Amandil and Elendil were great ship captains, and they were of the line of Elros Tarminyatur, though not of the ruling house to whom he belonged the crown and the throne in the city of Armenolos. In the days of their youth together, Amandil had been dear to Faradzun, and though he was of the elf friends, he remained in his council until the coming of Sauron. Now he was dismissed, for Sauron hated him above all others in Numenor. But he was so noble, and had been so mighty a captain of the sea, that he was still held in honor by many of the people, and neither the king nor Sauron dared to lay hands on him as yet. Therefore Amandil withdrew to Romena, and all that he trusted still to be faithful he summoned to come thither in secret, for he feared that evil would now grow apace and all the elf friends were in peril, and so soon it came to pass, for the men Tarma were, was utterly deserted in those days, and though not even Sauron dared to defile the high place, yet the king would let no man upon pain of death ascend to it, not even those of the faithful who kept Iluvatar in their hearts. And Sauron urged the king to cut down the white tree, Nimloth the fair, that grew in his courts, for it was a memorial of the Eldar and of the light of Valinor. At the first the king would not assent to this, since he believed that the fortunes of his house were bound up with the tree as was forespoken by Tar Palantir. Thus in his folly he who now hated the Eldar and the Valar vainly clung to the shadow of the old allegiance of Numenor. But when Amandil heard rumor of the, of the evil purpose of Sauron, he was grieved to the heart, knowing that in the end Sauron would surely have his will. Then he spoke to Elendil and the sons of Elendil, recalling the tale of the trees of Valinor, and Isildur said no word, but went out by night and did a deed for which he was afterwards renowned. For he passed alone in disguise to Armenelos, and to the courts of the king which were now forbidden to the faithful. And he came to the place of the tree which was forbidden to all by the orders of Sauron, and the tree was watched day and night by guards in his service. At that time Nimloth was dark and bore no bloom, for it was late in the autumn, and its winter was nigh. And Isildur passed through the guards and took from the tree a fruit that was hung upon it and turned to go. But the guard was aroused and he was assailed and fought his way out, receiving many wounds, and he escaped. And because he was disguised, it was not discovered who had laid hands on the tree. But Isildur came at last hardly back to Romena and delivered the fruit to the hands of Amandil ere his strength failed him. Then the fruit was planted in secret, and it was blessed by Amandil, and a shoot arose from it and sprouted in the spring. But when its first leaf opened, then Isildur, who had lain long and come near to death, arose and was troubled no more by his wounds. None too soon was this done, for after the assault the king yielded to Sauron and felled the white tree, and turned them wholly away from the allegiance of his fathers. But Sauron caused to be built upon the hill in the midst of the city of the Numenorians, Amenelos the Golden, a mighty temple. And it was in the form of a circle at the base, and there the walls were fifty feet in thickness, and the width of the base was five hundred feet across the, the, across the center. And the walls rose from the ground five hundred feet, and they were crowned with a mighty dome. And that dome was roofed all with silver and rose glittering in the sun, so that the light of it could be seen afar off. But soon the light was darkened, and the silver became black. For there was an altar of fire in the midst of the temple, and in the topmost of the dome there was a louver, whence there issued a great smoke. And the first fire upon the altar Sauron kindled with the hewn wood of Nimloth, and it crackled and was consumed. But men marveled at the reek that went up from it, so that the land lay under a cloud for seven days until slowly it passed into the west. Thereafter the fire and smoke went up without ceasing, for the power of Sauron daily increased, and in that temple with spilling of blood and torment and great wickedness, men made sacrifice to Melkor that he should release them from death. And most often from among the faithful they chose their victims, yet never openly on the charge that they would not worship Melkor, the giver of freedom, 
rather was cause sought against them that they hated the king and were his rebels, or that they planted against their king devising lies and poisons. These charges were for the most part false, yet those were bitter days and hate brings forth hate. But for all this death did not depart from the land, rather it came sooner and more often and in many dreadful guises. For whereas aforetime men had grown slowly old, and had laid them down in the end to sleep, when they were weary at last of the world, now madness and sickness assailed them, and yet they were afraid to die and go out into the dark, the realm of the Lord that they had taken, and they accursed themselves in their agony. And men took weapons in those days, and slew one another for little cause, for they were become quick to anger. And Sauron, or those whom he had bound to himself, went about the land setting man against man, so that the people murmured against the king and the lords, or against any that had ought, that they had not, and the men of power took cruel revenge. Nonetheless, for long it seemed to be the Numenorians that they prospered, and if they were not increased in happiness, yet they grew more strong, and their rich men grew richer. For with the aid and counsel of Sauron, they multitude their possessions, and they devised engines, and they built ever greater ships. And they sailed now with power and armory to Middle-earth, and they came no longer as bringers of gifts, nor even as rulers, but as fierce men of war. And they hunted the men of Middle-earth, and took their goods and enslaved them, and many they slew cruelly upon their altars. For they built in their fortresses temples and great tombs in those days, and men feared them, and the memory of the kindly kings of the ancient days faded from the world and was darkened by many a tale of dread. Thus al Faradzun, king of the land of the star, grew to the mightiest tyrant that had yet been in the world since the reign of Morgoth, though in truth Sauron ruled all from behind the throne. But the years passed, and the king felt the shadow of death approach as his days lengthened, and he was filled with fear and wrath. Now came the hour that Sauron had prepared and long had awaited. And Sauron spoke to the king, saying that his strength was now so great that he might think to have his will in all things and be subject to no command or ban. And he said, The Valar have possessed themselves of the land where there is no death, and they lie to you concerning it, hiding it as best they may because of their avarice and their fear lest the kings of men should wrest from them the deathless realm and rule the world in their stead. And though doubtless the gift of life unending is not for all, but only for such as are worthy, being men of might and pride and great lineage, yet against all justice is it done that this gift which is his due shall be withheld from the king of kings, our Faradzun, mightiest of the sons of earth, to whom Manwe alone can be compared if even he... But great kings do not brook denials and take what is their due. Then Ard Faradzun, being besotted and walking under the shadow of death, for his span was drawing toward its end, hearkened to Sauron, and he began to ponder in his heart how he might make war upon the Valar. He was long preparing this design, and he spoke not openly of it, yet it could not be hidden from all. And Amandil, becoming aware of the purposes of the king, was dismayed and filled with a great dread, for he knew that men could not vanquish the Valar in war, and that ruin must come upon the world if this war were not stayed. Therefore he called his son Elendil, and he said to him, The days are dark, and there is no hope for men, for the faithful are few. Therefore I am minded to try that counsel which our forefather Erendil took of old to sail into the west, to be there, ban or no, and to speak to the Valar, even to Manwe himself, if may be, and beseech his aid, ere all is lost. Would you then betray the king, said Elendil? For you know well the charge that they make against us, that we are traitors and spies, and that until this day it has been false. If I thought that Manwe needed such a messenger, said Amandil, I would betray the king, for there is but one loyalty from which no man can be absolved in heart for any cause. But it is for mercy upon men and their deliverance from Sauron the deceiver that I would plead, since some at least have remained faithful. And as for the ban... I will suffer in myself the penalty, lest all my people should become guilty. But what, think you, my father, is like to befall those of your house whom you leave behind when your deed becomes known? It must not become known, said Amandil. I will prepare my going in secret, and I will set sail into the east, whither daily the ships depart from our havens, 
and thereafter, as wind and chance may allow, I will go about through south or north, back into the west, and seek what I may find. But for you and your folk, my son, I counsel that you should prepare yourselves other ships, and put aboard all such things as your hearts cannot bear to part with. And when the ships are ready, you shall lie in the haven of Romena, and give out among men that you purpose, when you see your time to follow me into the east. Amundil is no longer so dear to our kinsmen upon the throne that he will grieve over much if we seek to depart, for a season or for good. But let it not be seen that you intend to take many men, or he will be troubled because of the war that he now plots for which he will need all the force that he may gather. Seek out the faithful that are known still to be true, and let them join you in secret if they are willing to go with you and share in your design. And what shall that design be, said Elendil? To meddle not in the war and to watch, answered Amundil. Until I return I can say no more. But it is most like that you shall fly from the star of the land with no star to guide you, for that land is defiled. Then you shall lose all that you have loved, for tasting death in life, seeking a land of exile elsewhere. But east or west the Valar alone can say. Then Amundil said farewell to all his household as one that is about to die. For, said he, it may well prove that you will never see me again, and that I shall show you no such sign as Erendil showed long ago, but hold you ever in readiness, for the end of the world that we have ever known is now at hand. It is said that Amundil set sail in a small ship at night, and steered first eastward, and then went about and passed into the west. And he took with him three servants dear to his heart, and never again were they heard of by word or sign in this world, nor is there any tale or guess of their fate. Men could not a second time be saved by any such embassy, and for the treason of Numenor there was no easy absolving. But Elendil did all that his father had bidden, and his ships lay off the east coast of the land, and the faithful put aboard their wives and their children and their heirlooms and great store of goods. Many things there were of beauty and power, such as the Numenorians had contrived in the days of their wisdom, vessels and jewels and scrolls of lore written in scarlet and black. And seven stones they had, the gift of the Eldar. But in the ship of Isildur was guarded the young tree, the scion of Nimloth the fair. Thus Elendil held himself in readiness and did not meddle in the evil deeds of those days and ever he looked for a sign that did not come. Then he journeyed in secret to the western shores and gazed out over the sea, for sorrow and yearning were upon him, and he greatly loved his father. But naught could he descry save the fleets of Ald Faradzun gathering in the havens of the west. Now aforetime in the Isle of Numenor the weather was ever apt to the needs and liking of men, rain in due season and ever in measure, and sunshine now warm and now cooler in winds from the sea. And when the wind was in the west, it seemed to many that it was filled with a fragrance, fleeting but sweet, heart stirring as of flowers that bloom forever in undying meads and have no names on mortal shores. But all this was now changed, for the sky itself was darkened, and there were storms of rain and hail in those days, and violent winds, and ever and anon a great ship of the Numenorians would founder and return not to haven, though such a grief had not till then befallen them since the rising of the star. And out of the west there would come at times a great cloud in the evening, shaped as it were an eagle, with pinions spread to the north and to the south. And slowly it would loom up, blotting out the sunset, and then uttermost night would fall upon Numenor. And some of the eagles bore lightning beneath their wings, and thunder echoed between sea and cloud. The men grew afraid. Behold the eagles of the lords of the west, they cried. The eagles of Manwe are come upon Numenor. And they fell upon their faces. Then some few would repent for a season, but others hardened their hearts, and they shook their fists at heaven, saying, The lords of the west have plotted against us. They strike first, the next blow shall be ours. These words the king himself spoke, but they were devised by Sauron. Now the lightnings increased and slew men upon the hills and in the fields and in the streets of the city and a fiery bolt smote the dome of the temple and shore it asunder, and it was wreathed in flame. But the temple itself was unshaken, and Sauron stood there upon the pinnacle and defied the lightning and was unharmed. And in that hour men called him a god and did all that he would. 
When therefore the last portent came, they heeded it little. For the land shook under them, and a groaning as of thunder underground was mingled with the roaring of the sea, and smoke issued from the peak of the Menel Tarma. But all the more did Al Faradzun press on with his armament. Here's the picture. <clears throat> In that time, the fleets of the Numenorians darkened the sea upon the west of the land, and they were like an archipelago of a thousand isles. Their masts were as a forest upon the mountains, and their sails like a brooding cloud, and their banners were golden and black, and all things waited upon the world of al Faradzun, and Sauron withdrew into the innermost uh, circle of the temple, and men brought him victims to be burned. Then the eagles of the lords of the west came up out of the dayfall, and they were arrayed for battle, advancing in a line, the end of which diminished beyond sight, and as they came their wings spread ever wider, grasping the sky. But the west burned red behind them, and they glowed beneath as though they were lit with a flame of great anger, so that all Numenor was illumined as, <laughs> illumined as with a smoldering flame, and men looked upon the faces of their fellows, and it seemed to them that they were red with wrath. Then Arfaradzun hardened his heart, and he went aboard his mighty ship, Alcarondus, castle of the sea. Many oared it was, and many masted, golden and sable, and upon it the throne of Arfaradzun was set. Then he did on his panoply and his crown, and let raise his standard, and he gave the signal for the raising of the anchors, and in that hour the trumpets of Numenor outrang the thunder. Thus the fleets of the Numenorians moved against the menace of the west, and there was little wind, but they had many oars and many strong slaves to row beneath the lash. The sun went down, and there came a great silence. Darkness fell upon the land, and the sea was still while the world waited for what should betide. Slowly the fleets passed out of the sight of the watchers in the havens, and their lights faded, and night took them, and in the morning they were gone. For a wind arose in the east, and it wafted them away, and they broke the band of the Valar and sailed into forbidden seas, going up with war against the deathless, to wrest from them everlasting life within the circles of the world. But the fleets of al Faradzun came up out of the deeps of the sea and encompassed Avalonie and all the Isle of Erisea, and the Eldar mourned, for the light of the setting sun was cut off by the cloud of the Numenorians. And at last al Faradzon came even to Aman, the blessed realm, and the coasts of Valinor. And still all was silent, and doom hung by a thread. For ar Faradzon wavered at the end, and almost he turned back. His heart misgave him when he looked upon the soundless shores and saw Tanakatil shining, whiter than snow, colder than death, silent, immutable, terrible as the shadow of the light of Iluvatar. But pride was now his master, and at last he left his ship and strode upon the shore, claiming the land for his own, if none should do battle for it. And a host of the Numenorians encamped in might about Tuna, whence all the elder had fled. The manway upon the mountain called upon Iluvatar, and for that time the Valar laid down their government of Arda. But Iluvatar showed forth his power, and he changed the fashion of the world, and a great chasm opened in the sea between Numenor and the deathless lands, and the waters flowed down into it, and the noise and smoke of the cataracts went up to heaven, and the world was shaken. And all the fleets of the Numenorians were drawn down into the abyss, and they were drowned and swallowed up for ever. But al Faradzun, the king, and the mortal warriors that had set foot upon the land of Aman were buried under fa falling hills. There it is said that they lie imprisoned in the caves of the Forgotten until the last battle in the Day of Doom. But the land of Aman and Erisea of the Eldar were taken away and removed beyond the reach of men for ever. And Andor, the land of gift, Numenor of the kings, Elena of the star of Elendil, was utterly de destroyed. For it was nigh to the east of the great rift, and its foundations were overturned, and it fell and went down into darkness, and is no more. And there is not now upon earth any place abiding where the memory of a time without evil is preserved. For Iluvatar cast back the great seas west of Middle Earth, and the empty lands east of it, and new lands and new seas were made, and the world was diminished, for Valinor and Erisea were taken from it into the realm of hidden things. 
In an hour unlooked for by men, this doom befell on the nine and thirtieth day since the passing of the fleets. Then suddenly fire burst from the metal tarma, and there came a mighty wind and a tumult of the earth, and the sky reeled and the hills sled, and Numenor went down into the sea with all its children and its wives and its maidens and its ladies proud, and all its gardens and its halls and its towers, its tombs and its riches and its jewels and its webs and its things painted and carven and its laughter and its mirth and its music, its wisdom and its lore, they vanished forever. And last of all, the mounting wave, mused green and cold and plumed with foam, climbing over the land, took to its bosom Tar Meliel, the queen, fairer than silver or ivory or pearls. Too late, she strove to ascend the steep ways of the Menel Tarma to the holy place, for the waters overtook her and her cry was lost in the roaring of the wind. But whether or no it were that Amaldil came indeed to Valinor and Manwe hearkened to his prayer, by grace of the Valar, Elendil and his sons and their people were spared from the ruin that day. For Elendil had remained in Romina, refusing the summons of the king when he set forth to war, and avoiding the soldiers of Sauron that came to seize him and drag him to the fires of the temple, he went aboard his ship and stood off from the shore waiting on the time. There, he was protected by the land from the great draft of the sea that drew all towards the abyss, and afterwards he was sheltered from the first fury of the storm. But when the devouring wave rolled over the land and Numenor toppled to its fall, then he would have been overwhelmed and would have deemed it the lesser grief to perish, for no wrench of death could be more bitter than the loss and agony of that day. But the great wind took him, wilder than any wind that men had known, roaring from the west, and it swept his ships far away, and it rent their sails and snapped their masts, hunting the unhappy men like straws upon the water. Nine ships there were, four for Elendil and for Isildur three, and for Anarion two, and they fled before the black gale out of the twilight of doom into the darkness of the world and the deeps rose beneath them in towering anger, and waves like unto mountains moving with great caps of riven snow bore them up amid the wreckage of the clouds, and after many days cast them away upon the shores of Middle-earth. And all the clouds and seaward regions of the western world suffered great change and ruin in that time, for the seas invaded the lands and shores foundered, and ancient isles were drowned, and new isles were uplifted, and hills crumbled, and rivers were turned into strange courses. Poor lass up there, she didn't make it before the waters took her. Say. Elendil and his sons after founded kingdoms in Middle Earth, and though their lore and though their lore and craft was but an echo of that which had been ere Sauron came to Numenor, yet very great it seemed to the wild men of the world, and much is said in no other lore of the deeds of the heirs of Elendil in that age that came thereafter, and of their strife of Sauron that not yet was ended. For Sauron himself was filled with great fear at the wrath of the Valar and the doom that Eru laid upon sea and land. It was greater far than aught he had looked for, hoping only for the death of the Numenorians and the defeat of their proud king. And Sauron, sitting in his black seat in the midst of the temple, had laughed when he heard the trumpets of al Faradzun sounding for battle, and again he had laughed when he heard the thunder of the storm, and a third time, even as he laughed at his own thought, thinking what he would do now in the world, being rid of the Adain forever, he was taken in the midst of his mirth, and his seat and his temple fell into the abyss. But Sauron was not of mortal flesh, and though he was robbed now of that shape in which he had wrought so great an evil, so that he could never again appear fair to the eyes of men, Yet his spirit arose out of the deep and passed as a shadow on a black wind over the sea and came back to Middle-earth and to Mordor that was his home. There he took up again his great ring in Barad-dûr and dwelt there dark and silent until he wrought himself in new guise, an image of malice and hatred made visible, and the eye of Sauron the terrible few could endure. But these things come not into the tale of the drowning of Numenor, of which now all is told. 
and even the name of that land perished, and men spoke thereafter not of Elena, nor of Andor the gift that was taken away, nor of Numenor on the confines of the world, but the exiles on the shores of the sea, if they turned toward the west in the desire of their hearts, spoke of Marnufalamar that was whelmed in the waves, Akalabeth the downfallen, Atalalante and the Eldaran tongue. Among the exiles, many believed that the sunnet of Menotarma, the pillar of heaven, was not drowned forever, but rose again among the waves, a lonely island lost in the great waters, for it had been a hallowed place, and even in the days of Sauron, none had defiled it. And some there were of the seed of Elendil that afterwards sought for it, because it was said among lore masters that the far-sighted men of old could see from the Menotarma a glimmer of the deathless land. For even after the ruin, the hearts of the Dunedain were still set westwards, and though they knew indeed that the world was changed, they said, Avalonye is vanished from the earth, and the land of Aman is taken away, and in the land of this present darkness they cannot be found. Yet once they were, and therefore they still are, in true being and in the whole shape of the world as at first it was devised. For the Dunedain held that even mortal men, if so blessed, might look upon other times than those of their body's life, and they longed ever to escape from the shadows of their exile and to see in some fashion the light that dies not. For the sorrow at the thought of death had pursued them over the deeps of the sea. Thus it was that great mariners among them would still search the empty seas, hoping to come upon the Isle of Meltarma and there to see a vision of things that were. But they found it not. And those that sailed far came only to the new lands and found them like to the old lands and subject to death. And those that sailed furthest set but a girdle about the earth and returned weary at last to the place of their beginning, and they said, All roads are now bent. Thus, in after days, what by the voyages of ships, what by lore and starcraft, the kings of men knew that the world was indeed made round, and yet the Eldar were permitted still to depart and to come to the ancient west and to Avalonia if they would. Therefore the lore masters of men said that a straight road must still be for those that were permitted to find it. And they taught that while the new world fell away, the old road and the path of the memory of the West still went on as it were a mighty bridge invisible that passed through the air of breath and of flight, for which, which were bent now as the world was bent, and traversed illmen which flesh unaided cannot endure, until it came to Tolerasea, the lonely isle and maybe even beyond to Valinor, where the Valar still dwell and watch the unfolding of the story of the world. And tales and rumours arose along the shores of the sea concerning mariners and men forlorn upon the water who, by some fate or grace or favour of the Valar, had entered in upon the straight way and seen the face of the world sink below them, and so had come to the lamplit quays of Avalonie, or verily to the last beaches on the margin of Aman, and there had looked upon the white mountain, dreadful and beautiful, before they died. <clears throat> This is from just before. And that is Akalabeth. We have but one more tale to tell of the rings of power and the third age. Until next time, my friends, beware the might of Sauron. <laughs>